Welcome to the Pharmacist Academy, where I use lay language, animations, repetitions, and clarifications to help you understand and visualize several medical pharmacy healthcare concepts. In today's video, we'll learn about pneumonia, the common bacteria that normally causes it, and how we treat it. So if you're ready for me to simplify this information for you, then hit the like button. Thank you. So although we normally think of a lung infection, by definition, pneumonia is the inflammation of the parenchyma of the lungs. So this inflammation is more often, but not always, caused by infections. The parenchyma is a type of tissue that consists of cells that carry out an essential function. Most of the parenchyma found in the lungs is in the alveoli. Although pneumonia can be due to other causes, in this video, we will focus on infectious pneumonia, and specifically bacterial pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia can be classified into three. Community acquired, hospital acquired, or ventilator-associated pneumonia. In community-acquired pneumonia, it is acquired from the community or within 48 hours of hospital admission. So this means that a patient was infected outside the hospital, came to the ED with signs and symptoms of pneumonia, and the patient was evaluated. Once diagnosis of pneumonia is made, we can say it's community-acquired. So even if the patient had been in the hospital for less than 48 hours, if they develop signs and symptoms of pneumonia and a diagnosis of pneumonia is made, we can say that it's CAP. For hospital acquired or HAP, it occurs in a non-intubated patient and it develops after 48 hours of hospitalization. So a patient has been in the hospital for more than 48 hours, signs and symptoms of pneumonia develops, patient is evaluated and diagnosed with pneumonia. It will be known as HAP. Lastly, we have the ventilator-associated pneumonia, or VAP. This arises more than 48 hours after endotracheal intubation. And of course, HAP and VAP are generally more severe than CAP because of more resistant pathogens that we see. So depending on which classification of pneumonia it is, you may see more of a specific type of bacteria than others. So for the pathogens commonly seen in patients with CAP, we have divided them into two, typical and atypical. So typical bacteria are easy to identify when they're cultured, and they also have a color when they're stained. Atypicals are hard to identify, and they remain colorless when they're stained. Now, for more information on gram staining and other basics of infectious diseases that help set the foundation, then check out my video, Introduction to Infectious Diseases, link right above. Now, some of the common typical pathogens are strep pneumo, H. influenzae, staph aureus. And some of the atypical pathogens are Legionella, Mycoplasma, Pneumonia, and Chlamydia, Pneumonia. So from top to bottom, these are listed from the most common to the least common. Now, despite these different pathogens, over 40% of CAP pathogens are unidentifiable. Common HAP and VAP pathogens include Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and E. coli. Now, just like any other type of infectious disease, in pneumonia, you must also play detective. The goal of ID is to find the right bug and match it to the right drug. So to do this, we must evaluate the patient thoroughly and obtain proper history. Patients will typically present with a fever. A cough that may be either non-productive or productive with mucus may be seen. And the cough is usually purulent, meaning there's pus and there may be some blood in there also. The patient may also have shortness of breath and be fatigued with normal daily routine work. The patient may also present with chest pain, and critically ill patients may present with sepsis or multi-organ failure. Next thing we want to know is, has the patient been in any situations recently where we see some of the common bacteria? So for example, Legionella can thrive in contaminated air conditioning and water systems, and Streptococcus can be found in crowded places like jails and shelters. You also want to learn of patients' other comorbidities. These comorbidities can increase the patient's risk of developing pneumonia, and depending on the comorbidities, some pathogens may be more common. These comorbidities include COPD, heart diseases, stroke, and diabetes. So for example, for COPD, we usually see pathogens like strep pneumo. Now this is the first step towards making a diagnosis. The patient presenting with signs and symptoms that makes you think of pneumonia, then we need to do some imaging of the chest to see what's going on in there. So we obtain a chest x-ray to look for consolidations and infiltrates. Infiltrates can be composed of white blood cells, protein, pus, blood, etc. And they accumulate in the alveoli due to the infection. This is all part of the immune response. 
So on a chest x-ray, you will see consolidation. So here we have a chest x-ray. So on the top, we have a normal lung. And at the bottom, we have a lung with bacterial pneumonia. So on the lower part of the lung with pneumonia, you can see how white it is. That is because that part of the lung is not filled with adequate air anymore. But instead, it has all these infiltrates. Clinicians sometimes refer to this as ground glass opacities. For selected patients in whom pneumonia is suspected based on clinical features, despite a negative chest x-ray, we obtain a CT scan of the chest. These patients include immunocompromised patients who may not mount a strong inflammatory response and therefore they have a negative chest x-ray. The combination of a compatible clinical syndrome, so the signs and symptoms plus imaging findings consistent with pneumonia are sufficient to establish an initial clinical diagnosis. But however, this combination of findings is nonspecific and is shared among other cardiopulmonary disorders. So the team can check other tests to get a confirmation that it is actually bacterial pneumonia. So a CBC with differential will help assess the white blood cell counts. In the setting of an infection, it should be elevated. I have a video on how to interpret a CBC, link right above. Next is the C-reactive protein which is an acute phase inflammatory marker, and it rises when there is inflammation. It doesn't really drive decisions to begin therapy, but it's nice to monitor the level after you start antibiotics because we would expect it to drop if the antibiotics are working. And then we have procalcitonin, which is a biomarker that is released in response to bacterial respiratory infections and can be used to differentiate the ideology of infections, so viral versus bacteria. It's been shown in some studies to reduce unnecessary antibiotic use. Similar to the CRP, its use is more validated for patients after they start antibiotics and monitoring the levels to see if the antibiotics are working. So in general, testing for the specific pathogen should be based on the severity of the pneumonia, the site of care, so inpatient or outpatient, and timing of the results. So let's say a patient has a mild form of community-acquired pneumonia that's being treated outpatient. There's no need to test for the pathogen. Now, empiric therapy in this case have been proven successful and knowledge of the pathogen causing the infection does not usually improve outcomes. Compared to a patient with a hospital acquired or a ventilator associated pneumonia, or even a patient that's admitted to be treated in the hospital for a cap, then we would consider checking the sputum or blood cultures before treatment. So how fast can we get the sputum or blood so we can start treatment right away will also impact the decision to get the cultures or just proceed with empiric treatment. Best practice is to obtain these collections before treatment for more accurate results. And while the results are pending, treatment can begin. So treatment of bacterial pneumonia depends on if it's CAP or HAP or VAP. For patients with CAP, the treatment is also based on where the patient will be treated so outpatient or inpatient. To determine this, we utilize scoring systems like the CURB-65 and the Pneumonia Severity Index. They help us determine this by assessing severity and mortality risk of CAP by evaluating patient clinical variables. We will view a picture of the scoring system in a second, but just for your own information, the Pneumonia Severity Index is listed as the preferred scoring system according to the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Now let's quickly view these scoring systems. First is the Pneumonia Severity Index. So this requires you to assess the patient for all of these and assign them points. Based on this, we will treat the patient either outpatient or inpatient. This also applies for the CURB-65, which requires less things to assess. Now, after determining if the patient should be treated inpatient or outpatient, we go straight to empiric therapy. For HAP and VAB, you go straight to empiric therapy after diagnosis and collecting the necessary specimens. Empiric therapy is treatment provided to a patient with an infection without knowing the specific pathogen that's causing that infection. We give empiric therapy antibiotics that has activity against common pathogens for the specific infection. We do this so we don't delay therapy while the culture for the pathogen is still growing in the lab and we do not know the specific pathogen yet. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, then please use just two seconds to hit the like button. It costs zero dollars to do this and it helps with the YouTube algorithm so that the video can reach more people. 
So for the empiric treatment of CAP, for patients treated in the outpatient setting, we could give them amoxicillin, doxycycline, or a macrolide. In patients with comorbidities like these, we give them broad spectrum treatment for two reasons. First, these patients are likely more vulnerable to poor outcomes if the initial empiric antibiotic regimen is inadequate. And second, many of these patients have risk factors for antibiotic resistance because of previous hospitalization and or prior antibiotic exposure. Recommendations include respiratory fluoroquinolones like moxifloxacin, gemifloxacin, and levofloxacin, or a two-drug therapy like a macrolide such as clarithromycin or azithromycin, or doxycycline plus either augmentin or a cephalosporin like cefpodoxime or cefuroxime. For patients with CAP admitted to the hospital with non-severe disease, meaning they don't require ICU admission, we could give them a respiratory fluoroquinolone or two-drug combination with ampicillin sulbaxum or ceftriaxone or ceftaroline plus a macrolide or doxycycline. For patients admitted to the ICU, we give them ampicillin and sulbaxum or ceftriaxone or ceftaroline plus a respiratory fluoroquinolone or doxycycline. For all these patients being treated for CAP, you may need to add antibiotics that cover MRSA and Pseudomonas if patient has risk factors for them. So in general, if there has been hospitalization or IV antibiotics given in the past 90 days. For MRSA, you can add vancomycin or linazolid. For Pseudomonas, you can add these agents here. In terms of treatment duration, CAP should be treated for at least five days and then continue antibiotics until clinical stability. Now, for the empiric treatment of HAP, empiric regimen should include antibiotics with activity against Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and other gram-negative organisms. Single-agent options include piperacillin and tazobactam, cefepime, levofloxacin, imipenem, and meropenem. Combination therapy is an option as well. In this case, we use two drugs that will both cover pseudomonas, and this is for patients that meet the criteria below. You want to use one anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam, so these are ceftazidine, cefepime, imipenem, meropenem, piperacillin, tazobactam, estrionem, plus either an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone. Estrionin may be used with another beta-lactam if no other second option is available. MRSA coverage is required in patients with the risk factors below, and agents that you can add include vancomycin and linazolid. For patients with HAP, we treat them for seven days. Now, treatment with VAP is very similar to HAP. So for the single agents, we have the same medications, for combination where two anti pseudomonal drugs are required, it's also the same, and here are the risk factors below. Then for MRSA, if they have these risk factors, we also use the same drugs. Duration of treatment is similar to HAP. We treat the patient for seven days. And for all three of these classifications, antibiotics should be de-escalated according to culture results. And that will be the end of this video. Make sure to hit the like button. Subscribe to show your support. Leave any comments down below. Follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.